this is really sort of a, a light ending to the, the, the whole course. Um, and uh, it, it's partly just to start the discussion, but also to see a, maybe a slightly biased perspective of where I think metabolomics is, is going. Um, and it might be useful for you, for some of you that are just beginning um, and are, are interested in, in, I guess, maybe seeing a bigger picture of, of what metabolomics might be or, or where it should be going. So this is some data from a year or two ago, but just the number of, of publications that have, have been um, presented or appearing in, in PubMed in metabolomics. And basically, it's growing exponentially. Uh, which is good. Uh, the very first publication was 1998 where they mentioned the word metabolom metabolome or metabolomics. And at the time it was metabonomics and back and forth. Um, anyways, the, the question has been is it's growing, but where is it going? Um, and obviously people would like to see it go straight up through the roof. Um, if you were doing the same plot for genomics, it actually is following the green line now in terms of publications. And if you did the same plot for um, proteomics, it's also following the green line. Um, if you're doing the plot for structural biology, uh, it would be following the red line. Um, so there are changes, obviously, with different fields and different uh, endeavors. Um, and so this is where, you know, will metabolomics continue on the upswing or, or level out? One of the issues of where it will go, up, horizontal, or down, has to deal with the, the bottlenecks in metabolomics. If we can't clear those bottlenecks, uh, it will certainly be a passing fad. Um, if we can clear the bottlenecks, then I think it'll probably continue to grow. So a lot of people involved in metabolomics, or those that have been thinking about it for a while, uh, are looking at these areas. One, trying to make metabolomics much more automated. And this is basically trying to copy what's already gone on with DNA sequencing. Next-gen sequences are basically uh, making or made sequencing a commodity item. Uh, you can sequence anything, and, and they literally are sequencing anything, and this is a great way of characterizing stuff because it's so automated. Um, you can buy the mini-ion or minion uh, Oxford sequencer and just stick it into your laptop and do sequencing at home, um, and it's that automated. So automated metabolomics is one trend. Another trend that's likely going to be continuing and it's also urgent is expanding metabolome coverage. We talked about the typical study uh, generally aims for between 50 and 150, maybe 200 metabolites. A few people can get up to 1,000, uh, which is really the exception um, rather than the rule. Other trends will be trying to make metabolomics portable. And again, look at what they've done with the DNA sequencer technologies, whether it's the MySeq, which is sort of a small refrigerator size, to the Mini-Ion uh, Oxford uh, system. Uh, they are now pushing towards um, sort of toaster-sized uh, mass specs. So making metabolomics portable will also make it much more accessible and cheaper. Um, when we started off yesterday, I was giving you the whole list of equipment that a typical metabolomics lab has, which basically is a Christmas wish list for all analytical uh, instruments. And that makes it hard to access. And many of you who are doing metabolomics largely work through core facilities rather than trying to run your own metabolomics lab. But what if I told you you could actually do metabolomics in your kitchen um, and for a few hundred dollars? So that's one thing that I think is going to be happening. Uh, quantification, uh, I've talked about that yesterday, I've talked about it today, I'll talk about it again. This is really, really important, and this has been a fundamental barrier that has prevented other omics technologies from being widely adopted into standard out-of-lab practice. So one of the examples of moving metabolics out of the lab is the concept of moving it into the clinic or into the field uh, or to the bedside or into the home. The Original motivation for metabolomics, actually, uh, if you go back far enough in the literature, was actually towards drug discovery and drug development. It was intended 
uh, to be a field that would prevent or avoid having to do necropsies on rats and mice and to have to do, uh, do studies on adverse drug reactions or toxicology. Um, it was taught uh, up until about 2002 and 2003 and then the pharma industry just completely abandoned metabolomics um, because it wasn't giving them the data that they wanted, largely because it wasn't very quantitative and the coverage wasn't very extensive. So I'm going to talk about each of these things a little bit and elaborate on, on them. And I, again, I'll invite people to maybe make some comments because I say this isn't, we're, I'm not teaching anything. I'm, I'm sort of discussing where things are going. So in terms of automated metabolomics, uh, I've mentioned this already. There's the, the, the wine screener and juice screener that, that Brooker has developed. So if you have a million dollars, you can screen your juice and study your wine. Uh, but it is a really automated system, and the equivalent of having a basil uh, wrapped in with uh, an automatic sample changer and an NMR instrument. I've also mentioned the Biocrates uh, system, and this um, was the first kit, still one of a few kits available. Um, it's a company in Austria. Uh, they sell them for about $4,000, and if you have the right instrument, <coughs> Uh, you can analyze about 80 or 90 samples at a go, and it's fully quantitative. About 186 compounds can be measured. And so the numbers work out to be roughly $50 a sample. So it's not very expensive, and it's fully quantitative and very automatic or semi-automatic. We've talked about basil already. You guys have given it a chance. So this is an example of non-commercial efforts to produce um, automatic uh, metabolomics. So this is an example of automated NMR. Um, it's a lot of work, uh, as we found, um, and it, it requires, I think, for automation, people follow specific standards. And so what we've determined, based on what's happened with using our releasing basil, is that uh, about 50% of the people uh, do it wrong. Uh, so we give them instructions, exact instructions, and then they try and use it, and they get it completely messed up. So we're doing essentially what uh, Biocrates is doing. We decided that the best thing to do is put a kit <laughs> together so they can't do it wrong. Uh, unfortunately, of course, that means it, it does cost money. But at some point, eventually people will figure it out, and then we won't have to do the kit anymore. Um, the GC AutoFit... Um, a little more elaborate because they're having to collect different samples and again you have to follow a process um, but if you follow the process then I think you guys have seen that it's pretty automated and that the if you've ever done GCMS and you ever tried to do it manually you would have taken well how long would it take you <laughs> anyways to do the quantitation and everything else it, it takes quite a bit of time so automation helps and, and I think this is something that's, that's going to be much more common and these aren't going to be the only things around. They just happen to be web servers that make the class easier to teach. Okay, expanding the metabolome coverage. This is arguably the biggest bottleneck in metabolomics. It's the one that obsesses uh, most people in the field. And this goes back to um, this issue of, of sensitivity. In the world of NMR, um, we're completely happy. We know all 220 compounds that can ever be found or measurable in mammals. Um, and in NMR, all we have to do is just figure out what's up and what's down. Um, that's because it's not very sensitive. Uh, from a publication perspective, NMR metabolomics is really easy uh, because you're always characterizing known things. You're always getting quantitative results. Um, the only limitation is that sometimes you don't find the, the really interesting compounds because the coverage is small. GCMS is a little better than NMR, but most of you are obviously in the LCMS world. And the reason why you're there is because of the sensitivity and because of the large number of compounds you can potentially detect. The problem with this, and we brought this up before, is that you're mostly looking at unknowns. You're only identifying or able to identify about 200 features out of the 20,000 that you're seeing. So that's a pretty poor rate. And, and so the question is, what are those other 18, 19,000 features? So the current thinking is that those features, those unknowns, are metabolites of metabolites. <laughs> 
That is, they are transformed products coming from phase one, phase two, microbial or promiscuous enzyme reactions. So phase one and phase two are the enzyme processes that the liver largely has to deal with xenobiotics. Um, so that could be the food coloring, food additives, drugs, food supplements. But they also work on endogenous metabolites, uh, and they'll process them. Your microbiome does a lot of processing as well, and it transforms things in many exotic ways. And then your own enzymes will process things. They're not perfect. They, they are fallible, so they will take some substrates that look sort of like what they're supposed to work on, and they'll work on them, and they'll make some un unusual or unexpected metabolites. So in the case of a food um, metabolome, um, we eat lots of things, we're exposed to lots of things, and this just illustrates the fact that they are all transformed. And so we have a good idea about what's going into us. Uh, we've talked about some of those databases like Drug Bank and FoodDB. We have very little idea what's coming out of us um, and that, the transformations. And the terminology that they're using here, which I'm sort of on the fence about, but they call the transformed food the food metabolome, the transformed drugs the drug metabolome, the transformed pollutants the pollutant metabolome. And then there's the endogenous metabolome, which are sets of metabolites. But it's the stuff at the bottom that is largely unknown. So how can we solve this problem of the unknown? So one of the ideas was to try and do systematic spectral collection. So if we took all of the compounds, synthesized all of them, then we could actually run them through every NMR instrument, every mass spectrometer, collect for everything, and deposit that into public databases. So that would essentially be the equivalent of the Human Genome Project in terms of an effort and cost. And uh, I put in down 100,000. I think it's, it's closer to 2 million compounds. And so if you said that the average cost for a person to synthesize a compound is between 1000 and $2,000, which is very low, uh, 2 million times 1000 it's a $2 billion effort. And it would take probably 20, 30 years because it's not something you can systematize. It's people doing work. And then you'd have to collect the spectra for these, and you'd have to collect spectra for many different instruments under many different conditions. And again, that would be billions of dollars. That's not going to happen. Uh, I wish it could, but it just it isn't. So this goes back to, can we do systematic uh, structure generation? Can we do systematic spectral prediction? And this is, in fact, a trend that's picking up tremendously. Um, so there are efforts now to calculate transformation products, uh, a tool called Biotransformer is being developed. Um, and then we've highlighted some of the spectral prediction tools. So CFMID now predicts both ESI MS or tandem MS spectra, and it also predicts GCMS or EIMS spectra. There are efforts to improve um, NMR spectra prediction. There are also tools that predict retention time, retention indices, collisional cross-section area from uh, ion mobility uh, spectra. All of those components and the capacity to predict them if we have the structure um, should make uh, metabolite identification uh, much easier and essentially cover the, those unknowns. The example already we brought up um, my compound ID where Although the structures aren't generated, the masses are generated for literally millions of feasible compounds running through just some very simple 75 transformations. And identification went up from you know, 5, 10% to almost 50%. So imagine having you know, a little smarter tool that generates the structures where you actually have not just the masses, but also fragmentation pattern, predicts um, also the retention time and retention indices. I think it potentially could lead to a, a much better, uh, more comprehensive coverage. So that's, a, I think, another trend that's emerging, certainly more effort already going into that. Several workshops and conferences have already been called on that. Next one is making metabolomics portable. Um, so I think some people may even have a Fitbit. Does anyone have a Fitbit? Okay. Um, 
there are uh, and has been a, a program that was sponsored by um, um, what do I just want to say is it I want to say Qualcomm but it's not um, it's called the Tricorder uh, X Prize and I think if you type in Tricorder X Prize on Google um, they've had their first round of entries and they've awarded people sort of seed funding but the idea is to be able to do um, precise monitoring of um, body electrolytes, physiology, um, and to do it on a smartphone uh, or something smaller. Probably the best known medical monitoring device is the blood glucose monitor. And they are now portable, they can plug into your laptop. And they're essentially a portable metabolomic device. They measure one compound, but they measure it very well and very accurately. So in the case of metabolomics, trying to make things a little simpler and more portable uh, is a way of democratizing it. As I said, there's only a few places around the Canada and North America that actually are able to do uh, full-scale metabolomics. Buying some of these instruments is millions and millions of dollars. Uh, getting trained to use them is decades of work. If you could have one that's um, handheld, um, any of you could use it. Any of you could probably run it. And this is actually a real instrument. This is, um, I think it's a little more than $1,000. Um, but it does a number of clinical assays, uh, chemical tests. Um, I mentioned the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize. Uh, that's the one that led to these Zensor things. And in fact, um, some of these things are already being made. There's a lot of work also going on in microfluidics, nanofluidics, and nanotech. So uh, capillary electrophoresis has now been ported to chips. HPLC can now be on chips. Uh, you can actually put GC, gas chromatography, on chips. There's also efforts to put mass spec systems on chips or cantilevers. They can measure down to a few Daltons. So it's happening in the sense that you could probably put a lot of these things on something the size of this mouse or the size of your smartphone and power them with not much more than a lithium polymer battery. In terms of measuring volatile compounds, it's already here. So there's electronic noses that are able to identify a number of volatile compounds. And the systems are not much bigger than uh, a smartphone or maybe a laptop at the largest. They look for patterns, and they are trained on patterns. So they use things like machine learning so they can identify the intensity of things. They function a little bit like our noses and their receptors and using uh, the equivalent of, of sort of like um, not necessarily proteins, but at least um, components that, that have avidity for certain combinations of molecules. But the idea of using receptors uh, is something that um, we're actually trying uh, at the U of A, and this is to try and make uh, metabolite sensors. And this is essentially um, moving sort of like the way that, that the glucose oxidase is an enzyme that's used for glucose sensing. The idea here is to use either antibodies that are specific to small molecules or paraplasmic binding proteins which are naturally occurring uh, metabolite binding proteins that are found in bacteria or aptamers um, RNA and DNA aptamers which are also naturally occurring compounds and can be engineered to bind metabolites so if you bind the metabolite um, these things will clamp on fine how do you get a signal so the trick is actually to modify uh, the metabolites so that they have a gold nanoparticle stuck onto them. And you can set up things that are either competitive uh, assays or just simply binding and release assays. And when the compound is bound, the gold nanoparticle, or is bound the regular metabolite, you'll see differential uh, changes. So you can use things like surface plasma and resonance. And so you can get little SPR instruments that are about the size of a laptop. You can use uh, 
enhanced Raman spectroscopy or surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, that's SIRS. Or you can measure equivalent of resistance uh, or impedance, which is um, the AC equivalent of resistance. And so these are, that's an electronic measure. The electronic one is actually cool because uh, they've already progressed uh, to making a handheld device, converting an impedance meter, and it's about, again, the size of a smartphone. And so it's using these gold nanoparticles and these optimers, and it's not measuring hundreds, but potentially should be able to measure four or five metabolites by the end of the summer. So this is a concept which can be generalizable because there are literally dozens of um, known small molecule antibodies, dozens of paraplasmic binding proteins, dozens of aptomers. And making these gold nanoparticle decorated metabolites is actually quite easy now. So hopefully, perhaps in not, uh, not too distant future, uh, it should be possible for everyone in this room, including uh, your friends and neighbors, to actually do metabolomics. The other part I think that's trending is quantification. Um, and this has actually made the cover of uh, a journal called Trends in Biotechnology. So here's a little picture of uh, a ghost, but it has this phrase here, a specter is haunting metabolomics. A specter being ghost, a specter of quantification. And it was really sort of a, a call to arms saying that it's important to quantify. Uh, at the time when this was published, 90% uh, of metabolomic studies were either semi-quantitative uh, or not quantitative at all. Less than 10% actually had absolute quantification. The trend is improving, uh, it may be up to 20% uh, now, but it's still not the level that really needs to be there. So the field really has to be quantitated if you're going to do any type of translation. And these days, uh, given that most of us are taxpayer-funded scientists, um, the reason why we're getting the tax dollars is because people are hoping that we're going to translate what we find into something practical. And um, I, I think this has been a, a problem um, in terms of, of moving things from the lab to the, to the practice. So quantitation, it's already happening. We've highlighted it with the Biocrates. We've highlighted it with um, Brooker. There's uh, Kenomics, a company in Edmonton that develops quantitative automated semi-automated NMR. There's quantitative efforts uh, you guys have already seen with Basil, Batman, and GC AutoFit. Um, and if you look at actually what's happened um, in terms of uh, quantitation, um, actually metabolomics is doing pretty well. So in, in terms of the number of uh, metabolites ever quantified, fully quantified in serum plasma, metabolomics record is 288. Proteomics, um, the number is now up. It's actually about 160 um, that were fully quantified. However, uh, we looked at the data, and um, I would say it's only semi-quantified. Um, um, so that's sort of with a qualification. Um, and it's certainly the data would not be transferable to, to other labs. Uh, cerebral spinal fluid, uh, 172 metabolites identified and quantified. It's a record. Proteomics is 130 proteins identified and quantified. Urine, 378 metabolites identified and quantified. Proteomics, 63. Um, a real challenge, in at least with RNA-seq and, and microarrays, is that you cannot absolutely quantify. You can get a relative quantification, but you can't move what you measure on an AFI chip to an RNA-seq platform, and between different RNA-seq platforms you can't necessarily move them, and between different labs often you can't move them. And this is why there's only been a tiny number of uh, transcript-based assays that have actually moved out of the lab into general use. Uh, on the other hand, there have been dozens of, of metabolite assays that have moved into clinical use or general use because of the absolute quantitation. So if you can get through that quantitation threshold and focus on that and make that part of your regular routine, then you can start thinking about moving metabolomics into some of the applied space. So just on that slide, if I can interrupt, how, 
how reproducible is the quantitation in metabolomics, like versus the proteomics? Does that make sense? Like, I mean, uh, you know, from lab to lab, or yeah. So it? typically, again, when you're doing absolute quantitation, the, the the target that many people want to have is an assay that has a coefficient of variance or CV yeah. of about ten to fifteen percent. Okay. So that means that within your lab within the instruments, with different people using the instrument, different people using the protocol, you should get uh, a result that's within 10 to 15 percent. Okay. Many people can and, achieve, and do achieve, you know, 5 percent or less. Um, it's a function of the abundance, um, but, you know, if someone's not careful, someone doesn't follow the, the protocol, then, yeah, you'll mess up, and that happens. Um, the, if you talk to people in, in the world of, of protein measurements that do ELISAs, um, they're happy if they get within 100%. Uh, there's, there's very little consistency between labs, and there's been real problems uh, with, with antibodies and things like that. Um, so uh, it was kind of shocking for me to find out just how variable and inconsistent a lot of these things are. Um, but in the, in the realm of analytical chemistry, you know, we're building on 100 years of people really focused on, mm -hmm. you have to measure this to, you know, precision of, you know, 1% or something. Uh, and that's something that you really should strive for. And it's certainly possible to do that. Not for every compound, maybe not for every assay, but if you do your best. And so the well-controlled Biocrates system, you know, they have a, QC system, uh, we see that, you know, 5%, 10% CV all the time. So in terms of moving ideas from um, the lab to the clinic, scientists don't do so well. Um, one example would be uh, biomarkers. So if you type the word biomarker in PubMed, you'll get about 700,000 hits. Uh, so lots of people looking for biomarkers, and only 200 or less than 250 have been approved for clinical use in the last 45 years. Proteomics has not yet produced a, a biomarker that's made it in the clinic. And proteomics has been around since, you know, the 1980s. There's some good proteins that have been identified by proteomics, but they immediately were converted to ELISA assays, in part because mass specs are really expensive, and quantification is really tough. Um, in the case of transcriptomics, again, because they don't perform absolute quantitation, there's only been five marker tests that have been approved for use, and they're not used very much. Uh, they exist, but I don't think they're really making money. On the other hand, um, just about everyone in this room has actually already had a metabolomic test. It's called newborn screening. And when you're born, they take a, a blood spot and put that onto a card and then send that into a mass spec. So it's done for every newborn in North America, every newborn in Europe, um, and many newborns in, in Asia now. So this is an example of a, an extremely successful omics test, and most of you have never heard of it, or no one talks about it. But this is, I think, one of the ringing successes of mass spectrometry, analytical chemistry, and metabolomics. They are measuring dozens of compounds on these infants. So if you look at the numbers, the number of approved tests that have come out of metabolomics slash clinical chemistry is just about 200. In terms of genomics, the number of approved tests is somewhere over 100. Now, it depends how you count it. You can count uh, every single gene variation that they can detect. And so for something like uh, cystic fibrosis, where there's about 600 or 700 mutations, they can multiply that and say, oh, we're doing 600 and 700 tests. But it's basically for a single gene. So if you look at the genes that they analyze, it's about 100, 110. There's about 60 ELISA tests things like C-reactive protein and some of the interferon interleukin tests. As I said, the transcriptomics is 5, and proteomics still is sitting at 0. Uh, 
So even though metabolomics arguably is one of the youngest fields of omics, it, it's actually been remarkably successful for making that, that translation. One reason is because there has been a focus on quantification and reproducibility, but it's also because metabolites are the canaries of the genome. So if you look at metabolites in terms of things like disease prediction and diagnosis, and these are just examples for humans, but you can use this for plants, you can use this for animals, um, you get some pretty remarkable results. You guys have already seen the result we got for preeclampsia when we looked at the rock curve for predicting preeclampsia. Uh, so 90 some percent. So there's early preeclampsia, which is really bad, and late preeclampsia, which is more an inconvenient, but both of them seem to be predictable uh, just using metabolites from the blood. Uh, looking at, uh, again, pregnant mothers, early stage, you can identify whether the, the, the fetus has a congenital heart defect. So you're not looking at blood in the fetus, you're just like taking mother's blood early stage. But it shows up. Um, other genetic defects, trisomy 18, trisomy 21, Down syndrome, uh, you can also detect that in the mother's blood in early stage. Um, idea here was you wouldn't have to do amniocentesis, um, or at least you could screen so you wouldn't have to do it for everyone. And then you guys have already seen the cachexia work, uh, and this too was something that showed that it was possible to predict cancer cachexia just looking at a spot urine sample. It's not perfect, but this is actually better than anything else, um, which is just indicating that in fact metabolites are these, these sentinels. They, they tell you what's going on because typically they're the first responders. They're the, the firemen of the, the, of the defense set. So you can predict diseases, you can also diagnose diseases. Um, and there are some diseases that are really hard to diagnose. So in the case of kidney transplants, if you know of anyone who's ever had a kidney transplant, um, typically they have to be monitored quite closely. And the way they monitor is they come in and they stick a giant needle in your back to take a kidney biopsy. So it's not pleasant. That biopsy is then analyzed by a pathologist and they say, well, it looks like there's rejection or there isn't. And then they do this sort of on a fa fairly regular basis. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if you could just have a urine test to say, looks like there's a problem. So the idea here was just simply seeing if you could look at urine, uh, which is what kidneys produce. And lo and behold, yes, you can in fact identify individuals that are rejecting or about to reject their kidneys with a very high percentage. Uh, performance. Uh, you can look at people with heart failure. In this case we're looking at blood um, and distinguish between whether it's systolic or diastolic heart failure and there's very different treatments. So again, to distinguish between systolic and diastolic heart failure is sort of a two-week battery of tests. Uh, this ideally would just be a blood test um, that you could get an answer very quickly. Some of you may know people who have chronic fatigue syndrome it's one that's obvious controversial. Is it a disease? Is it not a disease? Um, but uh, looking at individuals who have apparently chronic fatigue syndromes, there are very distinct metabolic fingerprints between those who are generally healthy. So it suggests, yes, it's a disease, and yes, it is something that can be diagnosed uh, by looking at something a little more objective than saying, are you feeling tired and worn out? Which I think all of you guys are feeling right now. Um, <laughs> There are other conditions, other disorders, uh, eosinophilic, eosinophilic esophagitis. This is a disease that will happen with kids, actually, where uh, they have to chew food for about an hour before they can swallow it because they have a very constricted uh, throat. And uh, it's a swelling that uh, seems to be somewhat related to um, Crohn's-like conditions. Uh, how it happens, no one knows. Why it happens, no one knows. Um, but it's hard actually to diagnose because sometimes they think it's just because the kid is uh, wanting to make trouble. And so it takes sometimes weeks or even months. But ideally if you have a blood test rather than having to often do tissue biopsies, which they do, and the tissue biopsy is stick something, a needle down your throat and take it out, uh, that would be you know, obviously unpleasant for a child. So using urine or blood is a lot easier. The most interesting and arguably the most successful one that we've been involved with is this um, detecting colon cancer. So colon cancer progresses, sort of what's shown here, from polyps. And so uh, 
typically if you get older, uh, they will have you doing colonoscopies. Um, typically people over 50 are advised to do that. Uh, if there's a family history, you may even start that at age 30 or 40. Colonoscopies are expensive and not actually pleasant. Um, there are other tests. There's the one called the fecal occult blood test, which basically looks for blood in poop. There's a less than 5% compliance rate when a doctor sends you home with, here's a, a vial and poop in it and send it back to me. So most people don't do that. Um, and even if they do, uh, the test is only about 20% uh, efficient or correct. So it's, it's better than, worse than tossing darts. So if you could do a urine test, which is a little easier, could you detect polyps? And that was the question we asked and worked with uh, colleagues in um, the medical school with Richard Fedorik. And the answer is yes. Uh, you can use urine and you can detect polyps. So this is before the cancer. And if you detect polyps, then you can start sending people to say, well, let's do a follow-up test. And there's some um, more precise tests off, obviously, colonoscopy. But you don't want to do colonoscopy on every single person. There aren't enough gastroenterologists to do it, and, and it's very costly. So this test was first uh, confirmed using NMR, and then we modified it so it could be <coughs> done with mass spec in a high-throughput fashion. And as of last week, I guess. Uh, it was now moved to a couple of uh, testing clinics in the East Coast in the US, and it's going to be offered in many other places. So this is an example of translating an idea from metabolomics into predictive precision medicine. Because there are things you can do about uh, early stage polyps, but if it's a late stage colon cancer, often it's too late. So the last part I'll talk about is just the idea of moving metabolomics back into drug development and discovery. So this is going back to its origins, which was the intent of, of metabolomics. It's not the only one. I've given you some examples of, I think, where it could be applied. And most of the things I've given you are examples of human uh, medicine, which you know, I think everyone's human here, so it's probably relevant to you. But it does apply also to animals, and it applies to um, uh, plant analysis. And many of those things, same sorts of things, same idea of, of, of quantification, portable field <laughs> devices, uh, moving it into environmental testing as well, uh, getting it out from the lab so it actually is used by the public or by physicians uh, will make a difference. But the one that I think still attracts a lot of attention and generally is the motivation that everyone says, the reason why I'm doing genomics is for drug discovery. The reason why I'm doing genomics is for drug discovery. Well, also you can say the reason I'm doing metabolomics is for drug discovery too. So this is a picture of the drug development pipeline. Um, average cost for a drug is, well, actually approaching almost one and a half billion dollars now, but some of them can get, get away for only 800 million dollars to get a drug. It takes on the order of 15 years to get a drug from the point of discovery to where it's used. There's a tremendous attrition rate uh, from drugs that make it just through discovery <coughs> phase. Uh, there's about a 1 in 5,000 chance uh, that they'll actually get FDA approved. So most people who work in drug discovery will, for their entire lives, never have a drug that's associated with their uh, career. In fact, the most successful person who actually got several drugs uh, through the pipeline ended up winning a Nobel Prize because she was so unusually successful. Um, now in terms of how uh, drug development happens, um, it's uh, a lot of chemistry in the first phase, but there's a lot of omics that's actually used uh, still to help with both discovery phase one and phase two. The interesting thing is, both in terms of the vision and the reality, is that metabolomics is and can be used through all phases of drug discovery, phase one, phase two, phase three, and FDA approval. People discover drugs and drug targets through metabolomics. That's happened. There's some really excellent examples already. Uh, there's uh, the testing phases, which are both preclinical and clinical, where they're le looking at drug toxicity, both in rats and also in humans. Tabulomics is ideally suited for that. It looks for physiological changes very quickly. Phase two, efficacy. Phase three, large-scale efficacy. Again, in many cases they want to target individuals, 
it's getting to the point where a third of all the drugs that are being produced now are being targeted to specific individuals or certain classes of patients. And so one of the best ways of characterizing or making sure that people are getting the right drug for the right condition is, again, through metabolomics. And then FDA approval and after, which they call sometimes phase four, is monitoring effects. Are people getting adverse effects for drugs? And in fact, gain metabolomics is frequently used. So this is just illustrating how metabolomics is used. Discovery, talk screen, efficacy, prioritization, safety biomarkers, clinical safety biomarkers, clinical efficacy biomarkers. So here's an example where you might be able to look at someone who is being monitored and the instruction is do not drink alcohol with this uh, medication. So you're tracking and tracking and now you can see this, but this is something that you can't do outside of metabolomics. Typically it's still done as a, um, in a questionnaire. Have you been drinking alcohol at all? Um, did you follow instructions? And I think most cases they're finding people don't. And some of the adverse reactions uh, that they see uh, can kill an entire trial, which can mean a billion dollars lost for a company. Um, likewise, you can look at people metabolizing drugs. So there are fast metabolizers and there are slow metabolizers. Uh, an example of someone who might be a slow metabolizer, how many people who, if they drink coffee or tea just before bed, cannot sleep? So you are probably a slow metabolizer. Uh, I drink coffee or tea just before going to bed, <laughs> and I sleep very soundly. So I'm a fast metabolizer. So again, these are things that are important for understanding uh, people's reactions to certain drugs, and this will indicate whether the cytochrome P450s you have are going to change them. And so looking at proxy drugs actually is a really useful way of understanding a person's drug phenotype. The traditional way of doing drug discovery uh, has evolved over the last 30 years, but this is the general pattern. Um, for the last maybe 10 years, people have been doing GWAS studies, but before that they do large-scale genetic studies. And they would look for people who had certain genes, uh, which indicated that they may have a proclivity for a certain disease. Um, and that was the point of the GWAS. Um, only about one in five GWAS studies actually identify SNPs or mutations um, that are sufficiently useful uh, or robust to, to suggest that they should go on to, to drug uh, efforts. Once they found those mutants or um, SNPs, um, only about half of them prove to be useful. Some of them are essentially SNPs that are found only in non-coding regions or, or targets that are too obscure to understand. From there, you might try and clone the gene, produce it, and get enough material so you can start doing drug screening. But not every gene is clonable, especially membrane proteins. They're very hard. So that often prevents the screening system to, to develop. So whether it's cloning or just developing an appropriate cell system, um, it's, it's hard. So one in five, one in two, one in two, and then you can start doing the large high throughput screen. And that's where they use libraries of a million compounds, all the ones you find in PubChem, to see if anything binds and inhibits. And a lot of these uh, large scale screening trials don't work. Um, again, about 20%. That's when that's the, the, the end of the discovery phase and the beginning of the clinical or preclinical phase. And that preclinical phase takes a billion dollars, 15 years, and success rate is about one in 500. Of the drugs that are approved, uh, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent actually have to be taken off the market because of subsequent adverse drug reactions or issues with respect to well, who knows what, marketing, approval, whole range. So if you multiply all these probabilities from the point where you begin with a GWAS study, the point where you actually have a drug in hand that's FDA approved, it's a 0.001%. And it takes at least 20 years and would cost, well, more than a billion dollars. What about metabolite-based drug discovery? This is something that not too many people think of, not too many people have tried, but in this case it's trying to look for people 
cohorts. So you'll do a, a, a metabolome-wide association study, MWAS, and like to see what comes out. So we showed you examples of people with you know, preeclampsia, not preeclampsia, colon cancer versus no colon cancer. Those studies were all done not with tens of thousands of patients as you have to do with GWAS. They were done with about 60 to 100 people. Total cost was about 200,000 or less. Most of the analyses, as you guys learned today, uh, can be done in uh, a couple of hours, maybe a couple of days. Uh, we've done the pathway analysis, and we can figure out some of the perturbations and the biological basis for some of these perturbations also fairly quickly. Um, and success for these are you know, pretty much guaranteed. In many cases, you can actually find things that suggest simple corrections. Um, some cases, it could be things like supplements. In some cases, they're clearly drugs that are known to alter or affect things. Um, and in these cases, um, it is possible to come up with some very actionable or repurposed drugs or, or advice. Uh, it also is possible to try and come up with other things like enzymes and, and uh, antibodies. And in fact, that's how some uh, inborn areas of metabolism are now treated. And then once you've actually maybe found something that works, you can go back to the metabolomics route and see, did I make an effect? Is there a positive change? And that's not very expensive. So what's an example of this sort of thing? Well, this is Stan Hazen's work. How many people have heard of Stanley Hazen? One or two. Anyways, he did something that was really quite remarkable. Uh, so everyone is told that, you know, avoid cholesterol, you'll get a heart attack if you take it, and cholesterol's bad, and... Uh, I think whether it's LDL and HDL and everything else, I think most people have been indoctrinated about how bad cholesterol is. What they were doing was looking at people who develop atherosclerosis, which is one of the consequences of cholesterol, um, and other cardiovascular disease symptoms from myocardial infarction. And they found uh, a compound that was very high in the blood of people with atherosclerosis and propensity for uh, heart disease. And that was trimethylamine oxide. And I said, well, that's cool. Uh, um, you know, here's a biomarker. Um, but let's go back a little further. Why is it high in these people? And then they started doing some, I think, some really original, useful biochemistry. And, and what they determined was, in fact, that the TMAO was actually coming from fatty foods. OK, we all know that eating fatty foods isn't good, but it wasn't the cholesterol actually was coming from the phosphatidylcholine stuff that you got to get in eggs or butter or, or milk. Um, but that wasn't the only story because in fact it's been well known that there are people who can eat all the butter and milk and eggs they want. In fact, the French do this all the time. They have the highest consumption of, of fatty foods in uh, in the world in some respects, and they have some of the lowest incidence of, of atherosclerosis. What's the trick? Well, this is where Hazen discovered, in fact, that it, it has a lot to do with the microflora that live in your gut. If you have the wrong bacteria, then the fatty foods will produce this atherotoxin called TMAO. If you have the right bacteria, then you can eat all the fatty food you want. Um, and this is the process. So Phosphatidylcholine is broken down to choline, gets into um, the system. Um, microbes uh, will convert the choline into trimethylamine. And I think you guys saw when we were looking at the rumen of cows, we saw dimethylamine, and if you look further down, maybe trimethylamine. So this is a product that is uh, a biogenic amine. It, um, uh, it's something that normally you don't want to see, but when it passes into the liver, it's converted to trimethylamine oxide. And normally, TMAO is secreted uh, in the body. In fact, you'll find it in fish. It's a, a, a salty seawater fish from cold oceans typically can have TMAO. So if someone eats a lot of fish, they will find TMAO in the urine, but it doesn't really end up long in the blood. But when it persists in the blood and when it's being produced by bacteria and produced by the liver, it seems to stay in the blood. It seems to activate the foam cells, which leads to a development of atherosclerosis. So the question is, um, what should you use as a drug target for uh, these things? Should you try and prevent people from eating fatty foods? Well, that's one thing, but lots of people like lobster and cheese and eggs. Um, can you try and target something in the uh, liver 
and they tried. They looked at some possible drug leads, but that actually caused damage to the liver. Um, could you target the bacteria? And in fact, they found something that actually works incredibly well. And it's a compound that resembles, um, I think it's is it dimethyl butanol, I think is the thing, trimethyl butanol, which looks a lot like choline. So this particular compound is found in high abundance in extra virgin olive oil. And that seems to explain this unusual phenomenon called the Mediterranean diet. How many people have heard of that? A few of you. So the whole idea is eat olives, drink lots of, or take in lots of olive oil on your salad, and then eat as much butter and cheese and lobster as you want. And that's the essence of the, the Mediterranean diet. And evidently this high consumption of olive oil is essentially preferentially removing or killing off the bacteria that would normally um, cause um, this production of trimethylamine. So there you have it. I mean, if you, if you want to cure heart disease and reduce atherosclerosis, just keep on pouring on that salad dressing. But this, I think, again, is a wonderful example of metabolomics going from a biomarker study, which says TMA is bad, or it seems to be a marker, tracing back through the biochemistry, and then highlighting something that no one really expected, um, and which seems to explain a bunch of things uh, in terms of cardiovascular disease, and suggests some interesting and very inexpensive and clearly rational therapies for um, treating a very widespread and important disease. So to wrap up, um, I think metabolomics is trending, uh, and I hope it will be trending upwards. And I think you guys have had a chance to look at you know, some of the examples of how automation is helping, how quantification is helping. Uh, maybe next year we'll be able to show you some portable metabolomics devices you can try and sample each other with. I think there's also, you know, clearly a trend towards expanded coverage. I think in order to make metabolomics relevant, we have to move it away from the lab and into the hands of, if you want, the public to users. So we can say it putting in the clinic, putting in the lab, putting in the field, putting it into the house. Um, um, democratizing it. I think that's a, it's an important drive. That's something that's sort of already happened with genomics, uh, partly by accident, but I think if we think about it rationally, this is something we need to do with metabolomics. And I think there's some really exciting examples of where it's already happening, where metabolomics is helping with rediscovering or under, improving our understanding about the diseases that we thought we all understood, heart disease and opening up new vistas for both the treatment and the rationalization for, for how some things seem to work. So with that, uh, I guess I'll, I'll wrap up.